Well, this morning we're in our second week in this uh, series, this journey towards Easter with Jesus, and we're calling it Determined to Die. Now, last week we looked at the book of Luke in the New Testament, and at this point in the life of Jesus, there's a definite shift where Luke makes a transition to get Jesus on the road towards Jerusalem. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we actually read these words. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, maybe you see those same exact words with me as I'm looking at there. Or maybe you have a different translation and that older phrase is used that he set his face to go to Jerusalem where the same idea is at work here. Jesus was determined to get there. And what was awaiting him in Jerusalem? Well, we know that there was a cross awaiting him. And with that cross, there was a death that would, that, that, that would be paid upon that cross. But beyond that, there's an empty tomb and there's a resurrection and all that it would mean for us. And Jesus was determined to walk that road. Jesus was determined to die so that we could really live. That's why he was on the way there, so that you and I could really live. He was determined to die for your salvation and for my salvation. Remember this, that sacrifice that he paid once and for all time upon the cross secured our salvation. So what his death did for us, but he also knew that his death would not be the end. Jesus understood that with that death would come a resurrection, that, it would, that there would be an empty tomb, and with the resurrection, what that would mean for us also would be that there is new life for us. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This doesn't mean... This doesn't mean that simply when we die, we go to heaven. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. That's not all that Jesus had in store. See, we are raised to new life here and now. Think about it. The resurrection makes possible for us today new ways of living. Makes possible for us new ways of loving, new ways of having Jesus live in and through us as he lives his life through his people. See, Jesus knew that he would ascend back to the Father. And that's what Luke alludes to there in that passage. He says, before he was taken up to heaven, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus knew he was going back to the Father. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 tells us that even now, Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. He's pleading our case. Jesus went to the cross knowing what it would cost him. But he also knew it was worth it. Why is that? Because you're worth it. Because I'm worth it. Because all people are worth the price that he paid on the cross because of his love for us. Jesus was determined to die for all people so that he could take his rightful place as a king of our hearts and lives. So that he could take his rightful place in this kingdom that is in this world, but not of this world. And I want to tell you something this morning. I was just thinking this morning as I was sitting back there at my my desk in the somewhat darkness of this room this morning before, before people started rolling in. And I was just thinking, we, we've done a great disservice sometimes within the church. And our, our church is no exception. We've almost turned the whole of following Jesus into, into one thing. Say this prayer and you're good to go. Say this prayer and that's, that, that, that's all there is to it. We might talk like we did last week about Jesus called to follow. But how often do we equip others to walk the walk that Jesus walked? How often do we equip others to to learn what it means to deny yourself, to take up your cross daily, and to follow Jesus in all of life? Well, last week, Jesus said there was a price, there was a cost in following him. I ask you again this morning, like I did last week, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? There is a cost in discipleship. There is a cost in following Jesus, and if we don't recognize that there is a cost in this life to following him, then we've missed the very words of Jesus himself. We've been guilty of this at times, not seeing the full scope of what Jesus came to do. You cannot have Jesus as Savior and not want him as the king of your life. You cannot. You can't have Jesus as Savior and not have him as the king of your life. You see, the church, the people of God in this world, were meant to be the visible representation of the kingdom that lives underneath the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. We've been so busy building our own little kingdoms. And what do we call them? We call them churches. (laughs) We've been so busy building our own little kingdoms. And Jesus said building the church was whose job? It's his job. Jesus is the one who builds the church. 
You can build a church and not have a lot of disciples being made, but if you start with Jesus' great commission and make disciples, you make kingdom people who live in love from a kingdom ethic that Jesus Christ said to, said to live and to love by, the kingdom ethic that Jesus embodied when he walked this earth, then the church will flourish. Then the church will thrive. Then you will begin to see new actions from new attitudes, new expressions of love as we serve our community and serve one another. And you will definitely see what Jesus called for, a new allegiance, your entire life given over to him. See, what I want to attempt to accomplish this morning, and I hope we can get there, <laughs> is to see these glimpses of another world that Jesus offers. Jesus offers these glimpses of another way to live this life, and it comes from another world. And he does this as he's on his way to the cross through the book of Luke. And we're going to walk a little bit further on this journey with him this morning. And we're going to take a look at something that Jesus taught very often about. You see, all of Jesus' healings, uh, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' miracle working, it gives us glimpses of another world as he embodies and as he ushers in something that he called the kingdom of God. And where we're going to wind up this morning is in Luke chapter 10. If you have a Bible in your lap, if you have a Bible on your phone, if you've scanned one of the things in this room that you can follow along with our sermon notes on, we'll get there. Trust me, we'll get there <laughs> at some point this morning. But what I want you to do first for me, I want you to pause for, I'm going to give you five seconds. And I want you to consider in your own mind, whether you're in this room or you're watching online this morning, I want you to think of three words that describe who you are. Five seconds. Figure it out. Not me, you. <laughs> All right. That's five seconds. Did anybody come up with the word king or queen? <laughs> anybody come up with that word? Husbands, now is the absolute perfect time to turn to your wife and think, I would have said queen to you, dear. You know, one of those sort of things. Um, now would be the perfect time for something like that. But I, I dare say many of us probably did not think king or queen. Maybe you didn't think of royalty when you described yourself. But I ask you another question. What kingdom are you in charge of? Where are you king? Where are you queen? That might sound like a strange question because I'm looking around the room and I don't see any recognized leaders of any monarchies that I know uh, within this room this morning. Um, but are you sure you're not a king or queen? Are you sure you're not in charge of a little kingdom? Maybe we don't completely understand the concept of kingdom. Uh, we, we've read about them. We've heard stories about them. Some of you have visited a magic one before. Anybody been to a magic kingdom where you put on those stupid ears and you've shaken hands with Goofy, one of those sort of places, you know? Um, but what does it mean to be a king or queen? It means to be in charge. To be a king means that you rule somewhere. If you have a kingdom, then that means your say goes in this place. And whether or not you call yourself a king, whether or not you call yourself a queen, there is some space within your life, even if it is within your own mind, where you think you are in charge. There is some place where you think that what I say goes. Now what happens when what we say doesn't go? Well, these are the times we get frustrated. These are the times we get bitter. These are the times we get angry. These are the times we get resentful. Let me ask you this question. Where is it in your life where your will is entirely carried out? Because that's what it means to be a king or a queen. That's what it means to have a kingdom. If your will is carried out within the specific borders of a specific place, once again, even if it's your mind, that's me, <laughs> then you're a king of that place. What happens, however, when your kingdom collides with another person's kingdom? What happens, perhaps, when what you say is the way things are supposed to go brushes up and rubs up against the way somebody else says this is supposed to go? Generally, the loudest voice wins. Or generally, in my case, it's the most stubborn person that wins. Whatever it is. See, we live in a constant tension in this world due to the collision of kingdoms. There are many spots in our world that are facing fighting. There is a major warfare confrontation going on over in, in Europe right now, but I'm not talking about military confrontation today. We each have, once again, these own little kingdoms, our own little preferences, our own little ways that we think things should go, and they constantly collide against other people's kingdoms. If we had more time this morning, I'd ask you to take a quick scroll through your newsfeed on your Facebook or your Twitter, and you will see people 
who are engaged in infighting between their kingdoms. Check out a comment section sometime. The way that you think something should go and the way somebody else thinks something should go, well, I'm going to cancel you. I will just block you. I will just, I'll kick you out, you know? There's a definite tension that we feel when it comes to living with other people in this world, but that's not the main tension that I'm talking about this morning. The strongest tension we feel in this life is found when our kingdom collides with the kingdom of God. When the way we think things should go collide with the way God says things should go. The tension is so strong. And Jesus knew that our ultimate allegiance was so important that a lot of his teaching centers on the reality of God's kingdom, on its inbreaking, on its arrival, and on its availability. And throughout this travel narrative from Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 15, the time frame we're focusing on, Jesus speaks a lot about it. But even before that, if you'll allow me to back up a little bit this morning, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus said to the people, he said that he must proclaim the good news of what? Of the kingdom of God. Because that is why he was sent. This is how Jesus begins his earthly ministry. Jesus comes straight out of the desert, and he begins his ministry by proclaiming good news to the people who long to hear it, that God's kingdom was now near. It was here, it was available, and it was a consistent message of his about the kingdom. And in other places, when he talks about the kingdom, he says, repent and to believe. Last week, we looked at Jesus' call to count the cost to be a disciple, to walk after him, to follow him. And that was an extension of this call of Jesus to repent and to believe the good news. Because what does repent mean? So often we think of it as a turning away from something, and really that's what it is. It's not just feeling sorry for yourself because you got caught in sin, but it's a literal turning away from the way you were going. But more than that, biblically, what repentance means is to change your mind, to change your way of thinking. Because when you change the way you think, Jesus knows that it will also change the way we behave. Because our thoughts guide our actions. Our thoughts guide the way we live our lives. Yeah, turning from sin and having remorse are are very, very good things, but our minds have to be transformed as well. So that's why Jesus says to repent and to do what? To believe. So what does to believe mean? It doesn't simply mean understanding some facts about Jesus. I've said this several times over the past few weeks. Not just simply having the right Sunday school answers or children's church answers, but to put your complete trust in someone or something else. Jesus knew that we would need a complete overhaul of the way we looked at the world, of the way we thought about the world, if we were going to live as citizens of his kingdom. Perhaps this morning you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, what does this matter? Why would Jesus being a king and all this talk about the kingdom of God have anything to do with me in America today? Well, we have to really kind of understand what's going on at the time frame when Jesus comes in and he's speaking about all of these things. See, after the people of God were taken away from their homeland and taken to be captive by other kings and other kingdoms, there was about 400 years after they returned from those places where God had not spoken. God had not spoken. The prophets were, were, were silent. God was, was, was in some ways silent, and they desperately were awaiting the reestablishment of the kingdom that they once knew. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. Remember, he's fresh out of the desert. (laughs) Shows up on the scene and he begins preaching the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God, but it was not in the way they expected. It was not in the way they had anticipated it. See, Jesus would soon enter Jerusalem, this city that was once looked at as the high point of the Jewish religious structure and the Jewish political structure. But Jesus didn't enter as a ho- on a horse as a conquering warrior king. No, how did Jesus enter? We'll look at this in a couple of weeks on Palm Sunday, on a donkey, as a suffering servant king who was not coming to conquer a city and overthrow an oppressive foreign government. No, Jesus rode into the city as a suffering servant to conquer what? Sin and death and the systems of this world that stand opposed to God's kingdom. Jesus came to this earth proclaiming to anyone and everyone who would hear that there was a reality of another way to live in the kingdom of God. And when Jesus spoke about these things, they treated him as if he was somebody who came into our town from the outside and were talking about things that they knew about our city, but we had no idea about them. Think about that. Jesus was opening up their minds and was telling them to change their minds, their thoughts, and even their behavior. And they looked at him like he was crazy. 
It ultimately got him killed. He spoke about the kingdom of God in ways no one else had ever described it. He talked about it in a way that was difficult to embrace, even by those who had spent their lives waiting for it to arrive. And throughout Luke's travel to the cross with Jesus, Jesus drops hints here and there, metaphors, stories, concepts of the kingdom in ways that they could understand. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? And he says, it's like a mustard seed, smallest of seeds. Just a few verses later, he says, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? And then he compares it to yeast that a woman mixes into flour and it makes dough. Later on in 1721, he says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In Luke chapter 18, verses 16 through 17, people are bringing little kids to Jesus. And Jesus says that anyone who will not receive the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. Then in 1825, a rich man comes to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what do I lack? What do I need to do? Jesus said, well, sell everything and follow me. And the man goes away sad. And Jesus talks about how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And and he tells his disciples a few verses later in 29 through 30 that no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children, that's pretty much everything behind. For the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. I want to tell you, in all of these instances, when Jesus is comparing the kingdom to all these things, and he's talking about how to enter into it in a way that was not understood, when he's telling people to leave everything behind to enter the kingdom, there is a definite collision when the kingdom of God collided with the kingdoms of this world. Even today, our world can be turned upside down when his kingdom brushes up against the kingdoms that we've set up in our own hearts. You see, to accept Jesus is to accept a new king. (laughs) And with a new king comes life in a new kingdom. So that simple definition we're working for for kingdom today is, is any place in which a person's will is done. And when we're talking about living in the kingdom of God, we're talking about any place where God's will is done, any place where God rules, any place where God reigns, any area where we give God control. You know, many people consider uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, they consider this and, and they call it Jesus' manifesto on kingdom life. And it really is a picture and a glimpse of an upside down kingdom. Think about how Jesus even taught his disciples to pray. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10, he said what? Your kingdom come. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Jesus is talking about all this stuff that we worry about, but he says seek first what? Seek first the kingdom. Jesus proclaims this arrival and this availability, and he invites people in. He asks them to seek. You see, Jesus does not overthrow our lives and force us into the kingdom. Entrance is through accepting his invitation and choosing to live with him as king. Once more, it's through repentance, turning away from my way and my will and turning to his way and his will, and then believing trusting that his way for our intended good is the only way to live our lives. And yes, that is a high call. That's why last week Jesus said, count the cost. It is a high call. But remember, Jesus has already paid the highest price for us. His life in exchange for our life. His blood for our sins. There are no higher stakes than that. But yet that's where it gets difficult for us. Turning from Matt's way... (laughs) turning from any of our ways to God's ways. Turning from putting me first to putting God and others first. You see, Jesus is teaching about real kingdom life, but so often we accept what what I like to look at or I like to call maybe a counterfeit reality. We accept sometimes the reality that we know what's best for our own lives, for our family's lives, for our church's life. Why should someone else? Why should my family? Why should my friends? Why should even God tell me the way things should go? We spent a lot of time in January and February looking at threads, tracing these storylines of scripture from the very beginning where God created life, and then sin messed it up. Sin corrupted the relationship between God and humanity, but what sin also did is sin distorted our perception of reality. You see, sin is always going against God's will. It's always going against God's way. And when we see life from the perspective that my will and my way is what's best, that is sin. We're rejecting 
God is king. And we're living in tension with his kingdom. You know, the only way for us to willingly follow Jesus in this kingdom life that he is offering is to surrender our spots on our thrones and allowing him to have his will and his way in our lives. You see, this is why I called this a collision of kingdoms earlier this morning, because our world can be turned upside down when we allow his kingdom life to come into our hearts and our lives. It's kingdom tension. Welcome to it this morning. It sounds too good to be true. All are welcome. Come on in. But it also sounds hard to live out. (laughs) How do we live it out? How do we live out this kingdom tension in our lives? Well, I want to give you a few ideas this morning. We have to start with a new idea of what acceptance really is. You see, kingdom living is a new acceptance. It's for us, and it's also from us. You see, as Jesus taught, often you will hear in Jesus' teaching these words. Sometimes he'll start out and he'll say, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And Jesus will take something that was common for that day and understood, and Jesus would kind of flip it on its head. You see, the religious leaders of that day, they had created a way for people to be accepted by God. You do this or do that, or you'd what? You don't do this or you don't do that. You follow our strict set of rules and you're going to be okay. And I want to tell you, we do not do much better in today's present age at telling people who's in and who's out of the club by the rules that we set up. Do this and you're in. Don't do that or you're out. We'll cancel you. We'll shut you out. You see, what Jesus does is he proclaims that it's not all of this outer stuff, but it's the inner attitudes of our heart that are reflected in our actions. Those are the things that God is concerned about. You see, the heart was what was important to God. And that's good news, I say, for those who are constantly living to try to prove themselves. Anybody try to prove themselves on a regular basis? The way you live, the things you do. Hey, God, look at me, I'm doing this. Hey, 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 mom and dad, look at me, I'm doing this. Hey, neighbors, look at my yard. Don't look at mine. My, my yard's a mess right now. Uh, grass everywhere. We've got some random neighborhood cats just roaming through our yard. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a jungle over there. Don't, I'm not trying to prove my yard to you this morning, okay? But how often do we try to prove ourselves? Jesus said, you are accepted just as you are. He says, believe in me. Jesus flips the common line of thinking. In many of our lives, even today, he says, the blessed aren't always those who are what? The wealthiest on the outside. Blessed aren't those who are the greatest on the outside, but blessed are those who have a heart that is set on me. And that's what the whole section of the Sermon, Mount, Sermon on the Mount that we have in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, were all about. Jesus said, blessed are those who, who, who realize their need. Blessed are the humble and poor. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the merciful. He says the kingdom belongs to these people. See, God blesses those who are pure in heart. God blesses those who hunger and thirst to be with him. He even says that his people, his kingdom people, will be blessed when the world mocks them, when they are mistreated, when they are persecuted, when they are excluded for following the way of Jesus in this world over and over and over again in Jesus' teaching. He holds up people who would not be blessed by the world standards, and he says, in God's kingdom, you are accepted and you are blessed. This is kingdom collision, kingdom of this world and kingdom of God. And that opens up the door now for those to be accepted into God's kingdom, regardless of where they have come from, regardless of where they are at this moment. And I want to tell you, this is for us sitting in this place this morning, but it is also the way that we should now look out and begin to see others. Is it not? We should see others who are accepted by God as those who are on the doorstep of of the kingdom, whether they're spiritually wandering, whether they're spiritually lost, whether they're spiritually searching, whether they are spiritually homeless. We welcome people home and say, you are welcome here with God because they enter the same way we do through Jesus. Blessed are these people in the kingdom. So kingdom living is a new acceptance. It's also new life here and now. And Jesus embodied this new life. He lived out this new life. He taught about this this real life, this abundant, overflowing life that begins in here and then it expands out to all of life. It's a life that is marked by understanding that no matter what may come, who's in control? The king who is on his throne. Not me, 
as if I can do that in my own life, not you, as if you can do that in every aspect of your life, but the king is in control. It's a life lived in a new direction. It's a life that obeys God word, God's word in all of life, and it follows in actions. It follows in attitude and selfless, sacrificial care and concern for the least. It's allowing God to shape our identities instead of carefully crafting what we want the world to see. Because we do this, whether you're online or not, you have a carefully crafted persona. Sometimes it's, it's magnified by Facebook or by Instagram or those sort of things. But we have carefully crafted personas in this life. We put on these faces when we come in on Sunday mornings. We put on these faces when we're out in the community sometimes. But we need to allow God to reveal to us who we are rather than just constructing it on our own. And a big part of living out this new real life is in the sphere of our affections. Because kingdom living is also a new love for God, and it is a new love for others. Luke chapter 10. I told you we'd get there at some point. <laughs> Luke chapter 10. Jesus has asked a question about the greatest commandment. And he uses this occasion not only to let the people know um, what he thought was most important, but also to tell them a story about how kingdom people should live in regards to others. If you're with me, it'll be on the screen. If you've got it in front of you, uh, you can follow along. But I'm reading out of my Bible here. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. And if this guy would have just stopped here, but he chooses to, to, to go on, and, and, and we see here in verse 29 that this guy wanted to justify himself. So we asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he opens the door for Jesus to just kick it down and just walk right through and explain who the neighbor really is. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, oil, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So when Jesus talks about love, when he talks about our affections, he says our all all of our love, heart, soul, mind, strength should be placed where? God first and foremost. But he says right up there with it is this love for your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus expands the view of neighbor by talking about a, a Samaritan, a person who came from the region of Samaria who were looked down by the Jewish people as being part of maybe considered a lower or lesser class. And if Jesus had started, you know, a joke with a, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan walk down the road, many people would have been waiting for the, the punchline to be the Samaritan. But Jesus expands their definition of love. He lets them know that the one who acted as a neighbor was the one who in this story would have been looked at as that guy? Him? He's the one who does this? The despised? The hated? At the very least, the, the, the different? And then Jesus says, well, you go and you do the same. You be a neighbor. You be a person who shows love to the least and to the lost. And this new kingdom ethic that Jesus is preaching, this new kingdom ethic that Jesus is embodying is, of course, this love for God with all that we are, but also a love for whoever your neighbor is. And who's your neighbor? I know the people who live around us, but I'm talking something deeper than that. Even if your neighbor is the hated and despised, like the Samaritan, even if your neighbor's a jerk. <laughs> Even if your neighbor's an enemy. Even if your neighbor walks their dog across your yard and doesn't clean up after it. Even if your neighbor is the one who's in the uh, 10 item or less checkout line with 12 items. Even if your neighbor doesn't go put their cart back in, in, in the shopping center. Even if your neighbor is whoever it is. Jesus says you're to love them like you love who? Yourself. I love me some me. 
And I know you do too. Not me, you. <laughs> we love ourselves. He says to love others. See, Jesus would embody this type of love, would he not? Jesus would embody this type of love very shortly in this story. Just a few chapters later, Jesus died for the unlovable. Who is that? Us. Jesus died for the enemies of God. Who's that? Oh, still us. Jesus died for sinners, and yet you guessed it, that's, that's us. See, Jesus embodied this type of love. He was on a crash course, bringing the kingdom of God up against the kingdoms of this world, and he won. And I want to tell you something this morning. How do we respond to this collision of worlds? How do we respond when our world is turned upside down when his kingdom comes crashing into our hearts and lives where he wants to have his way where he wants to have his rule where he wants to have his reign we can get mad about it we can get bitter about it we can reject it and refuse it but i want to tell you there's there's a better way there's a better way allowing him to live in us and through us ruling and reigning loving with a new love living from a new perspective i use the word counterfeit earlier this counterfeit reality we see the world with because you know we, we readily accept counterfeit in this life when jesus presents reality to us when you hear that word counterfeit where's your mind immediately go probably money right probably money uh, counterfeit bills created to pass the the look test you know um even with all the security measures in place counterfeiting is it's still succeeding in some ways so how are those who are trained to, to, to combat counterfeiting. Do you know how they're trained to do this? In many ways, they're, they're not trained to notice all the tricks. They're not trained to notice all the method, methods. See what they are do. They are immersed in what the real thing is, so they know what it feels like. They know what it smells like. They know what it exactly looks like. So when they come up against the counterfeit, they notice it right away. They can touch and say, well, this isn't the real thing. Because why? Because I know the real thing, and this is not it. The same is true with our lives. And the same is true with our church in this world. How do people know that there is another reality, another kingdom that is open and available to them? How do they know that the tension that they feel between what they always thought was supposed to happen and the way Jesus is knocking on the door of their hearts and the Holy Spirit is calling and beckoning them to this other reality, how do they know what's real and what's not? They're supposed to see it in us. The kingdom people of God. In us living new kingdom lives here and now. You see, God's church is to be a powerful proof to the world of the reality of another kingdom. Why should we settle for anything less? Why should we settle for the counterfeit realities that we have constructed and built our lives around? Well, it's because the scary thing about counterfeit is because it often looks identical to the real thing. On the surface, there may appear to be no difference. You see, in our lives... And even in this church, we can easily find ourselves going through the motions. We can easily find ourselves proclaiming to be a part of the kingdom and not being real on the inside. You see, to be a witness to the world of this offer of real life in Jesus when all around is counterfeit, we must allow God to take the rightful place as the king of our lives. We must begin living as kingdom people. It was so important for Jesus to let people know about this new life, this new acceptance in and acceptance of, this new love that kingdom people are supposed to live with, that he made it the majority of his teaching. The thing that makes it difficult for us to be a part of the kingdom of God and allow God to be our king at times is because there's only room for what? One king. <laughs> there's only room for one. When his kingdom collides with the kingdom that is within our hearts, there is only room for one on the throne. I ask this morning, do you need to know the acceptance that is offered by your king this morning? That it doesn't matter where you've been, that it doesn't matter what you've got going on, that he welcomes you in with open arms, that I invite you this morning to run to him. Embrace him. Do not hesitate. Don't walk. Run to him. Perhaps this morning you need to practice loving your neighbor, showing acceptance to someone whose kingdom preferences aren't the same as yours. Well, after you've run to God, you also need to be running to these people. Whether it's a call, 
whether it's a text, whether it's that old school face-to-face conversation. You know, we can still have those sometimes. Those are a little more difficult. But we need to run to others with this kingdom love. Perhaps this morning you just need to begin living the new life here and now that Jesus has made possible for you. A life lived through him, through the power of his Holy Spirit who takes up residence within us, changing us from the inside out. You can make that commitment this morning. You can consider even um, joining one of our groups where we're going to learn how to do this together. I said this morning that we're, we want you to text those couple of words. This is not an infomercial for that, but these groups, especially like our, our Alpha group, that would be for new believers or people just looking to get a jump start on their walk with Jesus, that would be a great place to learn how to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in all of life. We hope to be able to, to, to equip one another in that. Whatever you need to do this morning, however God is calling you, I want to ask Trevor and Hallie if they ever come. This is your moment to respond. If it's in prayer, then come and do it at the altar. If it's just standing and declaring the praises of God this morning, then I ask you to do that. However God is nudging you, however God is shoving you, however he is whispering, however he is shouting, respond as he leads. Will you stand and I want to pray over us? And then we'll sing and you feel led to respond as as God leads you. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was determined to walk that road to the cross so that we could really live. We thank you that here in just a few short weeks, we're going to celebrate the the awesomeness of the resurrection, that Jesus was dead, but he is no longer buried. He is alive. And we thank you that we can serve a risen king. And that as we leave this place, even this morning, that we go with a risen king and for a risen king to live and to love in all the places we find ourselves in our in our neighborhoods in our houses in our schools in our workplaces we are to be people who live in light of another reality that there is more to this life than than others know and see though they feel the tension maybe they don't know how to articulate it or put their finger on it well we're to be the people who live it out who embody it and who beckon people to know Jesus as King and Lord of their lives. I pray this morning in these moments that as you would draw us to respond, that we would be free to move and and to pray and to sing and to praise and to just wrestle with maybe the tension we're feeling in our own hearts. Jesus, we love you. These moments are yours. Holy Spirit, speak, move. Do what it is that you know best how to do. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.